Having just finished another classic low-carb ketogenic meal of pigs in a blanket, I thought I would follow it up with something in season, and that is rhubarb crisp. But this one will be on the low-carb side. If you're interested, keep watching. So, you know, rhubarb crisp is a classic, at least around here. Sometimes it's variations with the strawberry rhubarb crisp. Strawberries aren't yet in season, but rhubarb is in season right now. In fact, the rhubarb that I'll be using in this recipe was actually picked out of my garden. Now, it's not rhubarb I grow to harvest every year. It was actually a wild patch of rhubarb that was there when we moved into the house. Still grows. A little thinner, very tangy, but actually I like that in a rhubarb crisp. So how do you take rhubarb crisp and turn it from something very sweet into something very low carb? Well, obviously the number one thing that I'm gonna to have to replace is the sugar. So I'll be using a couple of different varieties of the monk fruit sweetener to sweeten this up. It's already a high fiber dish from the rhubarb, so that's just great. Rhubarb is definitely on that low carb diet. Uh, the challenge will be what else I put into the top part of the crisp. Well, I have a few things. Normally you would use oatmeal or something like that or, and, and flour. I'll be using a little bit of almond flour, a little bit of oat bran, and uh, another secret ingredient that I'll show you in a minute. So why don't we do that? Let's go down to my prep surface on the ground here. I'll start putting this together and it has to be baked. So I'll be doing that over charcoal because yeah, once again, we're under a fire ban here. So let's get started. All right, in full disclosure, I have not made in this in the woods before, but I have made it at home and it turned out great. So I expect that it will turn out at least as good out in the woods. Now, the other thing is I the recipe that I'm going to be using, rather than giving you specific uh, amounts, I'm going to give you the recipe in the video description below. The reason being is, uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, one is I had to reduce the amount to half the normal size so that I could make it small enough for a good size one person serving out here in the woods. The recipe I'll give you will be for a four to six person serving. Honestly, four is probably at the most you'll get out of it, depending on how hungry you are, of course, and how much you can eat. So uh, that's number one. Number two, the recipe that I'm using is a combination of a few recipes when I was doing the research for this to find one that I thought would not only taste good, but it was actually doable in the wood. I'll tell you, there's a lot of great recipes in the low carb ketogenic genre out there for rhubarb crisp or strawberry rhubarb crisp, but I don't think they all translate well to the woods. And the primary reason is a lot of them cut call for cold butter cut into the topping to make a nice light fluffy topping. Uh, that wasn't going to work out here. In fact, I was looking for something that would use melted butter and that's what I'm using today. So uh, the it'll, there'll be some melted butter, in this case ghee, I'll explain why in a moment. And yeah, so what's, uh, let's get going. Let me show you what I'm using. So to bake this in, this is the top pan out of my 14 centimeter zebra belly pot. Turns out to be just perfect and it barely, but just fits in the setup I'm gonna be using for baking. And you'll see that when we get to that point. So the first thing I'm gonna do is very quickly just give this a little bit of a, a greasing because uh, you don't want things sticking into in it. Although I'll, I'll be honest, they didn't when I did this at home, but it doesn't hurt to do it. It's not going to take away from it. So what I'm using is just a little bit of ghee to grease the inside. I think I'm going to have to get my bandana out to keep my fingers clean. So this is the ghee I normally have in my pack for cooking. It's not the ghee I'll actually be using for the recipe. So the star of the show, of course, is the rhubarb. So I pre-cut the rhubarb up at home this morning before I came out. And as I mentioned, I pulled this out of our garden so it is fresh. This is not one of the sweeter varieties. This is just a wild rhubarb, pretty much. And uh, it is tart, very tart. But you know what? I like that. So I can tell you I have about three quarters of a cup of rhubarb cut up in here. So again, I won't give you precise measurements because I'll let you work that out from the recipe that I do put in the video description. All right, gotta close that up, put that aside. So, oh, oh right, I was supposed to put that in, the, in a bowl to mix the other ingredients before putting it in my baking dish. Right, so I have a stainless steel bowl here. 
That's And the reason I'm putting them in here is because there are a few things that get mixed into the rhubarb before they get placed in the baking dish. So what are those few things? Well, here's an interesting combination, and I, I actually put this together before I came out. This recipe is calling for sour cream and an egg yolk. So uh, I wondered how I was going to transport those out into the woods. So I literally just took the sour cream and the egg yolk, the, the correct amounts, mixed them up in a small bowl at home, and then put them in my waterproof container. So that's what I'll do is, uh, I'm, that's why it looks like a dish. Kind of looks like a custard in a way. Right now, I suppose it's not too far off of the mark. Actually, it's pretty tasty, especially if you put a little bit of sugar in it right by itself. I won't be doing that though, because I have to have it all for this mixture. So here, this is one of those things, this is probably not a dish you would do three days out on the trail. Reason being, you couldn't keep things fresh that long. But for the today, it's not too bad. Pine needles. They are not part of the recipe. Okay, so that's one full egg yolk. Now I'll tell you the full recipe still calls for one egg yolk. So there was no way to come up with a half an egg yolk. So it's still one egg yolk. And as you'll see, it won't hurt it at all. So to get mixed into this, I have a mixture, again, pre-mixed at home, of almond flour, powdered monk fruit, and actually doesn't have to be powdered at all, just any regular uh, no-calorie sweetener, either stevia powdered or monk fruit powdered. And really, those are primarily erythritol which is a, the sweetener with some monk fruit or stevia mixed in. This is just a regular granular monk fruit blend that I picked up at Costco, actually. Cinnamon and xanthan gum, small amount of xanthan gum. So uh, total here, there, there is a third of a cup of all three ingredients mixed together. So I can put that in. Put the cover aside. And that's all that's going to go into the rhubarb mixture. And you just want to mix that through until it's creating a bit of a custardy look. I'll show you once I get it all mixed together. And this is what makes this, one of the things that makes this recipe a little different than any of the other recipes I've found for making rhubarb crisp is the addition of sour cream and an egg yolk to make a I don't know, like I said, I guess similar to a custard, but maybe a little sweeter. All right, so you can always use recipes that don't call for the egg and the sour cream. They'll be a little bit trail friend, more trail friendly because they won't require refrigeration. But here's what I've got right now. There is my rhubarb mixed up with the sour cream, egg yolk, almond flour, and monk fruit, and cinnamon, and xanthan gum. Now I can transfer that into my baking dish. And I think the ants have decided this might be something they want to try. Lots and lots of ants around here. All right. Don't want to waste any of that tastiness. I'll clean the bowl out, of course, and lick that clean. Well, not literally. Maybe. All right, so what I've done is I've just spread my rhubarb mixture around the bottom of my baking dish, my 14 centimeter zebra pot uh, plate, bowl, whatever they call it. All right, now I'll set that aside and we can get to work on the topping. So the topping is going to require me to melt some butter. Now in this case, I brought ghee out because ghee is basically, well not basically, it is clarified butter. And when it gets warm, ghee tends to go liquid anyway, so it won't take me much to melt this. I'll show you how I'm melting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll show you how I'm melting because I'm using an item that I have out for testing. Won't be any type of a review, but I'll show you what it is that I'm using just so you can uh, see that happening. But what I will show you right now is I have another container, and in this container is the rest of the toppings. So the toppings can, are made up of a brown monk fruit or golden monk fruit. Actually, the brand name that I picked up was Latanko, Latank I think, but there are a number of different brands that looks like brown sugar as opposed to just a white sugar. And it does have a flavor on it and a smell very much like brown sugar. So that adds to it a lot. 
So I have that in here, and an amount of that. I have an amount of oat fiber, which is a light brown color to start with. I'm going to be adding the melted butter and cinnamon again in here. So there's lots of cinnamon in this recipe. And chopped pecans. And the chopped pecans add to the crunchiness and the crispiness of the topping as well. But before I can mix these together with the butter, I first have to get the butter melted. And of course, I'm going to be using the bowl because I only have so many bowls here. So I'll move the camera around and I'll show you how I'm going to melt the butter. All right, so here's what I'm using to melt my butter just to make it nice and quick. And this will do it very quickly. So this is a product that I'm testing out for the first time in the woods. I've played with it a little bit at home, but this will be the first time I'm using it for anything out in the woods. So long ways from being a review, but it is a gas stove from Bulin. I think you pronounce it a bulin, and it comes with a one of those energy saving pots, the ones that are vented in order to capture the heat. And they mate together like that. And I just boiled up some water a few minutes ago for a cup of tea, and it less than a minute for a cup of water to be come to a boil. But all I'm doing today is just going to be heating it up on low because, again, there's my ghee, and you'll see how quickly it, it uh, will come to a boil. I'm oh, not come to a boil, but melt. So let's get this lit. It does not have an onboard piezo starter, so they give you one separately with it, and that's fine. I don't think I, you'd want to get your fingers down too low to, near to the flame when it, uh, when it ignites, but it's not going to take long for this butter, this ghee to melt. It's already melting. I don't want to burn it. I just want it to melt. See how quickly it's melting? Turn the heat down already. All right, it'll just take a, a couple of seconds for this ghee to melt. And what I'll do is as soon as it's completely liquid, I'll come back and we'll mix in the rest of the topping ingredients so you can see what it looks like. Uh, prior to putting it on top of the rhubarb. All right, being careful not to burn my ghee because that little stove puts out a lot of heat. My ghee is now all melted, as you can see. So I hope that you can see that there. And let me grab the rest of the toppings. We'll get those mixed in, stir those around. No, I discovered with the experience, is that gonna be too hot to handle? A little bit. Uh, I discovered with experience that if you mix this up and then set it aside for a minute, it, uh, it actually absorbs even more of the butter. So it doesn't look like right now you can see it's quite loose. Now, part of it could be that I actually added more butter this time than I did when I did this at home. So what I will do though, as I say, is I'll give this a minute or two to uh, absorb all the liquid ghee, start to set up some, and then we will add it to the top of the rhubarb. All right, so what I've discovered here working with my topping is that the bowl is actually still a little bit warm from being held over the uh, gas stove, and of course the melted butter is keeping it warm. So it's not absorbing as well as I would like it to. At the same time, you can see how much better it is now than when I first started. It's actually good enough, we'll say. It will work just the way it is. Besides, uh, once I get this assembled, I do have the charcoal started in my stove, but it's gonna take some time before I'm ready to bake with it. So I can assemble this, cover it, put it aside, and when I'm ready, then I can start cooking. So in the bottom, in the 14 centimeter zebra, pot, plate, whatever you would like to call it, the one that goes on the top of the can. I have my rhubarb with the mixture, again, of sour cream, egg yolk, almond flour, very little almond flour, by the way, uh, powdered sweetener, in this case, monk fruit, cinnamon, and xanthan gum. The xanthan gum is what's really helping to hold that all together. On top, I'll be putting my topping, which will crisp up, which is made with the brown monk fruit sweetener, or brown or golden, uh, oat fiber, melted butter, chopped pecans, and again, cinnamon. So I think I mentioned this is half of the full recipe. So I don't think this would go for four people. I think three people. 
Again, depends on how hungry you are. This is something you can have a little bit more of because there's no sugar in this. It tastes like there is, but there is no sugar in this. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty guilt-free. Tastes pretty good, right? just like that, too. All right, so there is my rhubarb crisp ready to go in my makeshift oven here on top of my wood stove as soon as the coals are ready to do it. And that's when I'll bring it back. All right, my makeshift oven is ready to start baking my dessert. So what I'm using today, if I haven't already mentioned, is my Flex Fire 6. And uh, I have the Omega plate, the last plate normally that has the feed hole in it, I have replaced with one that's designed specifically for use with charcoal. So no feed hole, keeps all the heat inside, directs it all upwards. I've already removed four briquettes from the, t the stove so that I can put that on top and uh, base inside. Oh yeah, that's what's unique about this. So the pan itself is just my carbon steel Pele pan that I've used a number of times for cooking in and out here. It's just a good size, good balance of weight as uh, it's a uh, carbon steel. So I've got it seasoned up pretty good. But what I found is I was using a small pizza stone and it was just a tiny bit too big. It wasn't coming into contact with the bottom of the pan inside. It was kind of off the top, off of the bottom by maybe a quarter inch. So I looked around until I found something at the thrift store and what I ended up with is a piece of marble. And it is green in this case, but it was a trivet. It was a one you would set on your counter and, uh, you know, put hot items on. Well, it had a little felt feet on it, which, of course, the felt feet had to come off. I stripped it of all the lacquers that I could off of it. And it's been sitting here getting hot for quite a while. So that's acting as my heat sink. With that, I should not need a, a spacer inside. So let's put that right inside on top of that. We'll get my cover, which is a pie plate, on top of that. I'll put the briquettes on top of it. Now, if you were doing this at home, you would do it at 350 degrees for 20 to 30 minutes. And there's no hard and fast rule. And unlike a cake, you're not going to be using a, a toothpick to see if it's done. Basically, what I want to see when I lift this off in about 20 minutes is I want to see the rhubarb bubbling around the outside. That's the, that's the goal, is to see the rhubarb bubbling up around the outside, and that'll tell me it is done. Of course, once it is done, it's going to have to set aside a while for it to cool off a little bit. Otherwise, you'll burn your mouth. I know I'm tempted to eat it right away, but it does taste a little bit better when you wait. In fact, it sets up a little bit, so it's a little bit better texture as well. So really, there's nothing to do now for about 20 minutes, and I'll come back and I'll have a look and see if the rhubarb is bubbling up around the outside, and that's when I'll bring it back. All right, let's do the big reveal. Uh, okay, take my pan off with the charcoal on top, set that aside. Ooh, look at that bubbling. Uh, okay, it's definitely cooked, but it is a lot more juicy than it was when I did this at home. Now, maybe as it cools a little bit, it'll be better, but yeah, it is hot and cooked. I suspect what happened is in the toppings, I had a little bit too much butter, or ghee in this case, but uh, I think it'll be tasty, so all I need to do is I'm going to have to wait a, quite a while, actually probably 15 minutes before that's cool enough for me to eat. But uh, there you go. There is the dessert fresh out of the oven. We'll let it cool off, and I'm going to make use of the heat in the charcoal right now to see if I can't cook something else up for myself. Make some coffee, maybe. All right, my uh, dessert is ready. I'll see if I can give you a bit of a close-up on it. Hopefully it'll focus in enough for you to... There it is. Okay. Yeah, okay, so a few comments on it in a minute, but before we do that, I have to do the taste test because we won't know if it turned out well enough until we taste it. Get my spoon. Still kind of hot on the bottom, the pan is, that is. So, uh, all right. Well, consistency is good down through. Mmm. Oh, the flavor is definitely there. Let me take my glasses off. The flavor is absolutely marvelous. But I think I know what happened. So it is cooked. And in this, I'm getting the 
tang of the rhubarb, the sweetness of the monk fruit. Lots of cinnamon in there. I'm getting some crunch from the pecans. I'm getting some texture from the oat bran and the brown monk fruit. But I'm not getting the crispness that I was looking for on top, like a crumble, like you would normally want in this type of a recipe. And I think I know what happened. Either I made a mistake in my measurement, which is exactly, I think, what happened, or it was the fact that I used ghee. Now, I used ghee at home, and it turned out just fine because melted butter is melted butter, pretty much. I could have used regular butter, and, but I still, this still would have called for it to be melted. So I think what happened is, is I measured out too much ghee. So what happened was the topping didn't stay as consistent and as dry as I would have liked it to have when, uh, you know, inside of the uh, pan as it was baking. Because I can see some of the ghee has gone to the bottom, just a little tiny bit. But it has no way affected the flavor. Man, I almost feel guilty eating this. It's it's so sweet from that monk fruit and the tang from oh yeah, this is this is just a classic early summer dessert. Could have been improved with a better topping on it to make it a little bit more crumbly, a little bit more crisp on top, but it browned from uh, using those coals on top of the pan. So it baked up. That little arrangement that I have with my pan that I've used before for baking worked perfectly for this and it's ideal. Yeah, so I should stop complaining about my cooking and start enjoying the results of it because it may not be as spot on as it was when I did it at home. And I used the same zebra pot, 14 centimeter zebra pot thing in the oven at home. But I think I was just a little bit more diligent about what my ingredients were. In this case, too much ghee. I'm sure of it. Too much ghee. Okay. Otherwise, I'll call it a success. It may not be what I was looking for precisely, but it doesn't mean that it was ruined by any means. The, the flavor is still absolutely there. Most of the texture is as well. So I, what I will do now is I'll just open up to you. Have you ever made rhubarb crumble or rhubarb crisp while you're out in the woods? Have you used a low carb recipe? And if you have, have you used any different ingredients from what I used? Using the egg and the sour cream in the bottom has given it a bit of a custard kind of a texture, and uh, it's actually quite nice. So that's something you may want to try. You may want to do a little bit more work on the topping than I did, or just be a little bit more diligent about your measurements. But if you give it a try, let me know how it turned out for you, What, regardless if you do it at home or if you do it out in the woods. Okay, I think that's all I have. If you have any comments or questions about this recipe or anything else I've done on this channel as far as cooking or any suggestions for future meals or desserts, please put them all in the comments section below. I did have somebody in my latest video recommend beef stroganoff, and I've been thinking about that for a while, so yeah, I'm going to come up with a beef stroganoff recipe that I can do out here in the woods. Not quite sure what it's going to look like, but we'll give it a try. All right, until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.